Welcome to Big Blend Radio with your hosts, Lisa and Nancy, editors of BigBlendMagazine.com. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Big Blend Radio with Nancy and Lisa. Every second Wednesday, uh, we interview authors connected with books for their amazing company that we've been uh, working with for years since actually the very beginning of Big Blend Radio, which this year, January 2022, actually marks 15 years of Big Blend Radio and 25 years of Big Blend Magazine. So this year, we're kicking off a whole bunch of new series with our friends. And uh, the second Wednesday, you're going to hear author interviews. And today, we're kicking off the series with author Ashby Jones. And he's joining us with his latest historical novel. It's called The Crossing. It's out now, and it is a standalone sequel to The Angel's Lamp, which is his first Ooh. novel. So we're very Ooh. excited to have him on the show. Of course, you can get on Amazon, all those great places. Uh, your independent bookstores ask for it. Um, but welcome, Ashby. How are you? I'm just great. Thank you. It wonderful. is wonderful to have yes. you here. We, we are very excited here about historical novels, and Nancy has got it, and she's all into the crossing and then today I told you you know it's the sequel to the angel's lamp so well, now see, she's, she's upset want, with me I want the angel's lamp now because I want to I want to read them both <laughs> but it's it is really it's it's a it's fast it moves very fast which I think is a good thing and um, it's exciting I want to see it as a movie I want Johnny Depp to be Johnny. <laughs> oh, you. Oh, boy. Well, because he's kind of already a pirate. Oh, you know. You okay, see well, let, me, yeah. let's, let's, let's back up a bit. She's all, she's, you can tell she's into the book, right? The yeah, crossing. That's cool. But Ashby, give us a little overview so that we don't do any spoilers because we're good at that. And that's, yeah, um, I'm trying not to. So but... we'll, we'll both behave. So you tell everybody an overview of uh, the crossing. The Crossing is, as you've said, uh, a standalone sequel to The Angel's Lamp. And um, in The Angel's Lamp, uh, we have a romance uh, between Nora Connolly. She was the daughter of James Connolly, who was one of the signatories of the 1916 Proclamation of Independence for the Irish. Um, the main character, Johnny Flynn, uh, was a Brit, but he eventually changed sides and became a rebel uh, in the Irish army. He was stationed at Kilmainham Jail, where he oversaw the signatories who were all being executed. Um, nor he met Nora in the hospital, visiting her father. And um, after a while, they became very close. They met again as rebels on the eastern side of, uh, of Ireland. Mm -hmm. And Nora did not realize that Johnny had been on the firing squad uh, to kill her father. Mm -hmm. he, the father and Johnny were very close friends. They met in the hospital uh, where the father had been blown up or his legs and he was in the cage and he was waiting to be executed and he was hoping that he would be. And when Johnny was on the firing squad, they were <clears throat> in Kilmanian outside in the yard where they, they killed people. And Johnny was nervous and he was about to move the rifle so he would not actually shoot Connolly. And Connolly saw his nervousness and screamed, Johnny, shoot now. And so anyway, the story goes wow. on and uh, uh, Johnny and Nora meet up and eventually she finds out that he was on the firing squad and she takes it upon herself to execute him because he is caught for having been on the firing squad later in the book. She takes him uh, to a bluff above Kinsale, Ireland, to kill him. She has the pistol in hand. She fires 
but she has moved her fingers about an inch. And of course, it does not go through his head. Mm. That's the end of the, the story, if you will. I hate to give away the ending, but it is a precursor to what happens or why the crossing was set up. Johnny was sent to America uh, on a ship that was designed to kill him because he had to clean out the hull of all the people who had died on this ship. He made it, however, he was thrown overboard and he, he survived. He moved into Hell's Kitchen in Manhattan and there the crossing begins. Um, yeah. And it is an ongoing book, his love for Nora, he can't overlook her. He does meet another woman, an apparition, if you will, uh, named Esme, who was raped uh, by the Black and Tans in Ireland. And she came to America where she helps children learn to sing and play instruments. And <clears throat> As the book goes on, he meets her and he finds out that Nora is coming to visit at St. Bridget's Church in Manhattan. And he goes there with Esme. And I don't know if you want me to finish the story or not. <laughs> don't don't give it all don't, away. Don't I, give it all away. Don't, don't give it all away. Don't give it all it's away. It's exciting though. It's a really yeah. Do you see why I say this? This should be a, a movie. Yeah, it's dramatic, but it also I think we don't hear that much about the Irish in America and how they came over here, and why they mm -hmm. came over, and how rough the Irish. I don't know. We've been doing a lot of interviews with Irish musicians lately, and they were talking about you know <laughs> if it wasn't for Rory Gallagher, they wouldn't have got out of Ireland. But it's just you know we were just talking about like Northern Ireland especially, but. Um, they're really, you know, when we lived in England, there was still that, um, and that was in the 80s, uh, there was still that tension, with, you know, Ireland and, and mm -hmm. England. And then over in this country, it seems to be kind of a forgot, forgotten thing of how the Irish came over and how rough it was. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and with, with your protagonist, he comes over and you know, it, it wasn't easy. Even on the ship, it was not easy. That's why we put ourselves, for those watching this on, you know, on YouTube and Facebook, um, we put ourselves in water because we understand right. like what happens when you walk the plank, yeah. as, as you will. But um, it, it's interesting that you're doing this with the other lady being an apparition uh, too. So she's, does he know she's real or does he know she's an apparition? Well, she, she in fact is real. Mm. She considers herself an apparition because she was mutilated, raped, and disfigured. Uh, oh. And um, therefore, there is surrealism brought into the book to, in a sense, support the idea that she has at least surreal apparitionist qualities. Mm. Uh, she definitely is a, a human being. Oh, wow. Just she's, as she's yeah. got a, a personality that um, makes her seem above being a human being. Yeah, that that, that is very true, and mm -hmm. uh, I I like that conclusion. I think you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's she's bigger than life. Well, I I love this idea also of surrealism being part of a story because it's you've got historical fiction and in, in a weird way I almost feel like historical fiction really lends itself to that it almost is that because it's something we can't really it's it's the only way we're really it's tangible to us what happened in the past is through storytelling and through the arts and through music you know it it. To me, that is surrealism in a weird way. <laughs> you know, does that make sense? <laughs> I think that's. I think that's very well said. It kind of um, parallels, if not cuts into, the whole idea of revisionist history, which um, I don't care for. This makes it much different than truly hoping to revise history, uh, but it, it allows you to see in my opinion, uh, things 
from very, very different angles and draw very, very different conclusions, many of which can be quite positive. Mm, and feel. Mm. Yes. Feelings, you know, that that's the thing too. What led you to this story But for both books? Um, what started this? Because I, I found an article about you going like, you, you've been working at this for a long time, this story, <laughs> and you've you know, went through, you know, you've basically sent a lot of letters over time to publishers and you just would not give up. Yeah, that is so true. Uh, I was about to give up on the book years ago and I have a good friend who is an independent editor. Yeah, I think, and previously, I think he was a senior editor at St. Martin's, but I, I may oh, have. Wow. Mm. And uh, he read what I had written all of the angel's lamp years ago. And I was ready to give up on it because I did not feel I actually knew enough about Ireland. And uh, he <laughs> said, I don't care if you have to sell a kidney to stay <laughs> to, <Wow. laughs> to feed your family, go back to this novel. And so I did uh, and spent time in Ireland and read okay. about 32 books on Ireland, both fiction and nonfiction. And um, so that, that beefed up the pursuit. Now the pursuit itself started uh, years ago when I was in Ireland and um, the signatories, seven of whom were executed were all kept in Kil Kilmanium jail. I found that out from the receptionist at the hotel we spent in. Wow. Huh. No Irish history go there. I did. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife and I were on the loft right outside Patrick Pierce's cell. Wow. And this sounds very strange, but it occurred. Um, I felt this cold draft go down the loft. So mm -hmm. I turned to my wife, Laura, and I said, good Lord, did you feel that? She said, feel what? She said, no, I, I didn't feel that. So I turned to uh, a fellow next to me. We were on the tour. There were about 12 of us. And I said, wow, that, that, uh, <laughs> that was something. He said, what was something? I said, well, that draft. And he just looked at me like, what? What are you talking about? Mm. This is where the story gets very bizarre. I had read not long before the thoughts of someone who said the molecules of the dead are where they spent time and they stay there forever. And that came hmm. to me as weird as it sounds. It's not weird to us. <laughs> I, just, I just trembled. Uh, and from hmm. that on, I was determined to know more, learn more, and piece together a story, which is which resulted in the angel's land. Wow, so, that's amazing. That mm -hmm. you know, when we were in England, we went to a lot of castles, and they had mm -hmm. those dungeons mm -hmm. where the prisons, the prisoners were. I mean, it, they were brutal. Yes. Mm -hmm. You've got to think about the conditions: the wet, the damp, that cold, mm -hmm. damp. Yeah, and um, you know, you could see where they had written and etched. And I remember as a little girl going, this is some crazy feelings. Like I could feel it. And we've been through some places mm -hmm. where you, you, like I've had a hand on the back of my head in a Gothic jail in Louisiana, in a DeRitter, mm -hmm. Louisiana. They have a Gothic jail. It's the only Gothic jail. It's and, crazy. Um, it's like a lighthouse when you go on the inside, it's circular on the mm -hmm. inside and they hung or hanged, excuse me, two uh, guys in there for murdering a taxi cab driver. And the whole town came out to watch it. And then they carted the bodies out in front of people. And it just was a crazy thing. And back in those days, when that happened, there were picnics for hangings. Yeah. I mean, this is a global yeah. thing in medieval times, mm -hmm. there were picnics. But when you go to England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, that, that medieval history where you see guillotines where they really did use that to chop someone's head off. It's brutal. Yeah, it is. And it, it's it, brutal it, history. And it's you can you. feel it. You can you feel can. it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can. And, and mm. that feeling, if you will, is 
again, what motivated me to, to learn more. Wow, that's amazing. Because when we travel, you know, we travel full time, and you get to a place, and eventually I'll go, oh, I'm starting to know how my way around, you know, and I go, okay, it's time to move on to the next place. And then we'll come back around and things will change or not a lot, but you have this feeling sense of place feeling. And mm -hmm. I told Nancy, it's called, it's deja vu dust that yeah. wherever we go, we leave a footprint, even if you're not doing anything mm -hmm. damaging, but, but something is left on you and yeah. it's deja vu dust. And it's like a memory. There's all these senses that I don't think have been really documented properly in science. Well, maybe they are. I just haven't read them, you know, but there's something that connects you to that place once you've been there. It can take mm -hmm. you 50 years to go back, but you'll have a sense. It's well, I think, different. you know, if you, you're, you're talking about your life and time here right now. But if you look at your family tree and you're fortunate enough to be able to follow back a family tree, some of the feelings that you feel in certain places start to make sense. Like maybe you haven't been to, say, Scotland before. So you go to Scotland and you feel like, oh, I've seen that before. I know that place. Well, you don't because you haven't been there. But maybe you have a relative or somebody in the past that you're connected to in some way that says hey I used to live there you know and you just feel it because you're not really talking to them but something gives you that that momentary shiver of oh you know I and that deja vu like this has happened before or mm. I've been here before feeling that it's really hard to explain do you, do you have that feeling when you were there did you feel like a connection? I mean, is your family Irish or? I did feel a connection. Mm -hmm. uh, you're absolutely right about that. Um, and I went on, I think it was 23 and me to find out that I'm primarily Welsh. Um, oh, wow. Irish and I'm 25% French. And I have ironically spent a lot of time in France and mm. long before I had any idea that I was 25% French. Mm. Uh, so, yes, I, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. Mm. See, that's, do you drink a lot of French wine? <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> okay, Lisa. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I drink a lot of uh, California wine. <laughs> oh, that, well, you've got a wonderful state of wine, let me tell you. That's a wonderful, and, it, and friend, the French helped mm. in that, too. So just yes, like, they did. Connected. But, you know, I, you know, also what's interesting about your uh, book, The Crossing, is that Johnny's coming over at the time of prohibition and mm -hmm. prohibition in this country. I mean, this was insanity, but um, it really ties into his career at that point. Tell us a little bit about how that connects with him. What was happening here? Well, OK, a, a couple of things. He, uh, of course, took a job. He didn't have a, a lot of options, but he was a rum runner and he would take rum cool. from the ships. Uh, you know, this is why Nancy grabbed your book. Yeah, he has a thing about rum runners. I love and rum. California and Mexico <laughs> has had rum running history. Just so I'm just going to touch on that. But anyway, sorry, carry on. So he was a rum runner. Yeah, cool. yeah. And so that uh, connected him, if you will, uh, with Haley's, which is the bar he spent a lot of time in and was before the end was offered a job there. But uh, he was he did not take that job. Well, he took the job for a while, but that's about all. Uh, but the prohibition, in my opinion, was fascinating. Um, some a couple of things about it. Uh, women were very much on the front of prohibition, mm -hmm. and in Manhattan, they were the ones on the front of getting rid of prohibition. So they, <laughs> they, it, cool. You, these were guys, but no, the women uh, led led one of one of the battles, uh, which I, I always found you know, to be fascinating. Hmm. I didn't well, know that. Yeah, well, maybe they like their husbands a little bit more mellow out. than when they're not. Or maybe they wanted some because you never know what women were doing in the parlor with tea. Well, they were drinking laudlum or whatever. The, what yeah, there was some, but, was a, yeah. yeah. But wine was allowed at that time just for medicinal purposes. Rum. So it's kind of like what happens with marijuana. 
Yes. You know, we're allowed, you can have weed for health, um, but then not recreation. But isn't health and recreation connected? I'm just saying. <laughs> Good way but, of looking at it. But it is interesting because I don't think prohibition works anywhere. It no. just doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't work, but it does create a whole bunch of industries that no one sees what's going on, you know? Yes, uh, very true. Mm -hmm. so this is interesting. You bring it in. And so he's, he's a rum runner, which we, you know, that kind of history is so fascinating. It's very romanticized, isn't it? And yet at the same time, it's very dangerous oh. what, what goes on. Mm -hmm. Very true. And of course, at that time, you had the origins of mafia uh, mm -hmm. coming oh. to Hell's Kitchen. In fact, they were publishing menus uh, for 25 cents. You could hire them to cut off someone's arm uh, for five dollars. Wow. Someone to get rid of them. Um, so, you know, that was a whole another thing that came in. Um, and of course, you know, the mafia, in a way, was involved in prohibition. They well, were involved in a lot of things for a lot longer than a lot of people realize. True. Yes. Yeah, the, the mafia is um, an interesting thing to study. Mm -hmm. Yes, ab absolutely. So you know, that's, have... Yeah, I'm just thinking back to prohibition time and we did an interview. I mean, it's going to be like 14 13, 14 years ago with um, a lady who had, and I think she had a co-author who had done a historic photo book of the bars of New York and Manhattan during prohibition time. And they had like hidden areas for people mm -hmm. to go in and drink. So when you're and the mafia was involved in these mm -hmm. hidden places. Well, yeah. I mean, it was within their interest because they supplied a lot of the alcohol. That, that, that is exactly right. And mm -hmm. did, Work their way into Haley's Bar, Haley's being the uh, the hideout, if you will, uh, mm. as me and, and wow. others. So that's very true. Yeah, wow, wow. it's well, it's cool. fascinating to me. You know, so I I want to read it now. This is I not... know you have to read it, but I get to read it first. Ha ha. She's the <laughs> so, mother. Yeah. Um, so, what do you think about Johnny Depp playing Johnny? Johnny Depp playing Johnny. Uh, I don't think I <laughs> call. <laughs> no. Um, no. Uh, sure. uh, I, 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 let's see. As I remember, Johnny Depp was having some financial problems with his um, holdings in Los Angeles. So, so, so I don't know if he's back on the screen or not. But oh, I don't know about that. But he's had I some know, issues. He, Let's put yeah. it this way. And he's already been a private. Uh, I was going to say privateer, a, a pirate. He's already been a, a pirate. pirate. He's been a pirate. pirate. Yeah. So you can't. You can't do that so, now. Then who would be your choice of actor to play Johnny in your book? It's it's funny that you ask that. Um, not funny, but uh, I've been told several times that this should be a mini TV series or it should be made into mm -hmm. and ask therefore the same question. Mm -hmm. uh, who, who should be Nora? Who should be Esme? Who should mm -hmm. be Johnny? And quite honestly, I, I don't have any answers. I mean, I'm... Mm -hmm. I, just, uh, I, I think it's subjective to it. who's reading the book, who they see, because it's visual. Yes. When you're reading, you have your own visual sense. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a personal thing because it and that's a hard thing I think when it goes into a movie which is great it reaches a lot of people it's a you know but it's at the same time it's like okay now that's the person you see so if you go backwards you have to read the book first then watch the movie but if you watch the movie then you know there's that whole weird thing it's like you've mm -hmm. they've already put the character in your face it's, <laughs> you know? it's very true and and one uh, on Nora's side um I I like Bono and his daughter, I mm. thought, would be uh, a very mm. fun, but uh, that was just, that's just. That's interesting. Hmm. It's good to get, yeah. Might as well mm. go to Ireland, right? So mm. what, you know, mm. you started writing, did you ever think he would be writing a novel? Did I ever think I'd be writing a novel? And then two. Yes, uh, I did. Mm. I've effectively written forever. Um, oh. I've got. Uh, a book review, if you will, um, by uh, a student 
who read my first novel, which was written in college. And it was uh, never published, but written there. And in college, I studied under William Hoffman. Uh, he was uh, a well-known author, a best-selling author, and I, I studied literature under him. And um, he, he was, that was a real motivation for writing and I just loved it. And I've, I've written ever since. And it took a mm -hmm. long time to, uh, to have a story published. And um, I, I've got another book coming up in the next year or so. So cool. it's been with me uh, forever. And then later in life, um, I studied uh, under Leonardo Bercovici uh, who was uh, a very well-known screenwriter. He was, uh, in the McCarthy era, he was banished from the United States. Wow. Mm -hmm. Ooh. All against the nonsense of the McCarthy era. Mm -hmm. and, uh, when he came back, he did some very, very well-known uh, movies. So all of this along the way, uh, just, they were just continual, stimuli mm. sitting down and writing and i just i, I love it mm. the screenwriting part mm. of it that's really interesting to take that kind mm -hmm. of you know that that kind of education because i think it makes you move makes things move fast like nancy was like mm. wow this is just you know Woo, she's off, she's off and running with the book, you know. <laughs> so that's the thing you're saying it moves yeah. really fast. And and I think mm -hmm. movies do that. And I think there's some, you know, we've we've heard like we know a murder uh writer, a murder mystery writer, she's always killing off her husband. So yeah, we know her husband poor guy. I mean, the, he doesn't have a chance. Yeah, Tam, Tammy, I'm like, you know, she's the sweetest lady. You know, I know go and see in her house and them. she'll feed you and she's make you cozy. She's the sweetest lady. And then you read her book and you're like, Tammy, how could you write this? Yeah, and then she gives a smile and then I look funny. at her husband, I'm like, you're dead next again. Yeah. But it's like, said, how, how are you going to kill him next time? And he's just sitting there looking at us. Yeah, I was like, yeah. what kind of questions? <laughs> but she, she said learning poetry helped her mystery writing. So I wonder about like screenwriting helping write historical fiction to make you have that feeling and have those, you know, the, that mm -hmm. vividness and that connection. And it's all it's almost like the surrealism part of it is almost metaphorical, too. It's kind of it's interesting how how it all comes Com to play comes together yes uh, uh, absolutely it is yeah. are, are you familiar with the writer wilbur smith i <clears throat> only to the point of knowing the name <laughs> okay I, uh, it, there are parts of your book that very much uh, i feel like oh um i it, it's different you're both very different but there's parts where i feel that's a Wilbur Smith. Um, the and then he's way, putting you right in it. Yeah, yeah, like you wake up and you're already in it. You know, and so there, there's part of that. And I admire that because um, you feel it rather than uh, read it and have to reread it. You know, that's what I like about, I think, you know, when, when we have historic novels, as long as the history is is correct. Um, then I think it should be in school so that kids would like history because mostly they don't because of the way it's taught. You know, this like mimeograph sheet. Of course, I'm dating myself here, but you know, here's all the dates and this war happened and that war happened and it doesn't mean anything. You can't relate to it. So a historical fiction is something that could teach history in a really entertaining, memorable way. I, I think that's uh, very well said. Very well said. I, I would like to see your book in schools for, you know, young does, adults to Does the romance relate help? To. Is that part of it with historical fiction that there's always a good love story? There's the family sagas and dramas. Mm. Does that really help us connect back to, because really history is about people and it's good gossip. Right right so it is is that part of it by having the love story connected that helps us really get it and, and relate I th I, again uh, well said yes uh, i i think without question 
Yeah. So do you read a lot of historical mm -hmm. fiction? Or do you like what happens with your writing and your reading like to not be influenced? <laughs> I I read I read some historical fiction now. The definition might be a little different. Um, writers that I really enjoy are Gabriel Marquez, uh, Hundred Years of Solitude, and other books that he's written. Uh, William Styron, uh, uh, Thomas Wolfe, uh, The Homeward Angel, Run of Time in the River. We just went to his gravesite. Oh. Yeah. I've been there too. Oh, it's wow. Cool. <laughs> That's <laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah, in, in, in Asheville, Asheville, North Carolina. Yes. And, and mm -hmm. Ironically, I went back with one of my daughters uh, about two years ago, and I was shocked because I had been back 30 years ago and seen the house, and it hardly had any buildings next to it, and now it's in, it's almost in downtown. <laughs> so, it's so, a monument. It's, a mm -hmm. it's part of our national park system now. Yeah, his house, and it's, it's so interesting nice. about the angels. Mm -hmm. So, like to me, I think his father, you know, running this morgue, mm -hmm. and having the angel, like it, it was like he he knew how to do adver billboard advertising for funerals. Like I, you know what yeah. I mean? It was very interesting. And going through the cemetery, we were staying mm -hmm. in a bed and breakfast. The, I got to give him a shout out, the lion and the rose, because this is where we we ended up in Asheville unexpectedly. Went stayed at this bed and breakfast, and they're like okay, you only have this many hours. And they're like, well, we have a cemetery right behind the B&B. And we're like, oh, we're there. And then mm -hmm. Henry's there and Thomas Wolfe. And then mm -hmm. I was reading this book in their room about Asheville, you know, the Zelda, Zelda Fitzgerald and Scott, you know, I was just like, oh my gosh. And we keep going to Asheville. It's not, it's not, talk about the, the deja vu yeah. dust. There's yeah. something that we keep mm -hmm. ending up, we're going in circles to Asheville all the time. And I think it's this writers, these, these areas where these writers have been and their stories, it's just trippy. I mean, it's, it, I don't know. There's something that just keeps doing that. It's a magnet. Yeah, mm -hmm. Exactly. And, and I carry that uh, same sentimentality, if you will, uh, to, to Paris. And mm. uh, ah. with the belly puck, I'm just a, a freak <laughs> about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's fun. You know, from Fitzgerald to Hemingway and and oh, Hemingway too. And uh, we need to go to the Keys, Nancy. Um, just so we can go. Hang me, out. Twist then you can arm. have some rum with. You can <laughs> pretend that Hemingway's sitting there. You know. Yeah, I think it's important to drink rum once in a while. Yeah, <laughs> and but we could drink rum with his cats who have what is it? Six exactly. Toes or something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Something about his cats. <laughs> you had a lot of cats well you know you know books forward you're on the very first series with them you know with us traveling the country we are actually creating a literary landmark map of all the places we've been that connect to literary history oh, and man. we just you know you think oh we're going to go here we start looking it up or we literally stumble upon it like we were mm -hmm. in santa fe new mexico and they oh there's a lot of writers obviously it's like you know the hub of arts but who knew the governor's palace is where Ben Hur was written? Yeah. I have no idea about that. That's you know, exciting. It's just like, how did that happen? It did. Mm -hmm. You know, he he was there as a soldier and wrote it at night yep. mm -hmm. in his bunk. Oh. You know, it's crazy how people write. And then for you, like, I know you were were you working during this whole novel writing experience that you keep doing, or yes, uh, I was working the whole time and the whole time. Um, I had four kids and um, wow that's work <laughs> yes that, that, that's work too yes <laughs> we, I mean we pets it that's work <laughs> <laughs> humans are a whole other thing <laughs> yeah my son said uh, to go back to what you just said my son said dad you live by the four w's you get up in the morning and you work then in the afternoon you run W-R-U-N. Mm. Then you write for three hours and then you have your wine. Oh, see? That that says it all. That's the best way to live life. So you always had a segment for writing. How hard That's is it funny. To, to, do you just close the door to everyone? Do you just kind of go, you know, and it, it's like, how do you, it's like meditating. Mm -hmm. You know, to me, I need the wine first. But then that then it's tainted, right? 
So how, <laughs> how do you, you know, how do you separate what's going on in the world to suddenly just sit down and focus on the writing or is the writing going in your head the whole time that you need to get there and put it down? You, it, it kind of a little bit of all. Mm. Um, the, the writing, it, it, when I come and sit down at the computer, um, the world changes. Time passes like I can't believe. Mm -hmm. Often I, I do, I run a lot. And often when I'm out running and I'm thinking about the story, I'll look around and have no idea how I got to where I am and stopped. Um, so running is swirling through my little brain all the time. Uh, writing, I mean, is, is mm. Mm. all the time. And uh, when I'm, I'm very fortunate, um, my first wife passed away at a very early age. And uh, my second wife, both wives have given me, if you will, the latitude to write. Oh, that's mm. nice. Uh, mm -hmm. I am blessed with mm. the families I've had. So um, I just come back and sit down and kind of everybody reali realizes that and I do my thing and then go have my wine. So uh, see, that's a good thing. I love that. I love it's that. Very, and I like that you talk. It's good for your blood pressure. All of this, but also <laughs> running. I think there's something about the, you know, to me, it was walking. You know, mm. you don't want to see me run. That doesn't look good. Um, but walking, mm. there's something like early morning walks where you could sit mm. at night and my brain will go. I've got like a ding bat brain. You probably can tell by talking. <laughs> it just goes ding, 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 ding. This connects with this. It's one of those brains that will connect everything with everything in some way. So it's really hard. And it, it, it's exciting. So you can't sleep. But then if I walk in the morning, suddenly everything just comes to place. It just makes sense. Mm -hmm. You could look at a butterfly and go, thank you for that. <laughs> now I know what to do. There's something about, I don't know if it's the physical movement and the fresh air, but it's there is something rhythm. about doing that, even in communication with others, that they say that before you go to a holiday gathering, even run it off <laughs> before you go see them. Because because it's about running. run off the, it's, I think it runs off running, walking, mm -hmm. exercise, some kind of physical movement helps clean out whatever the craziness is you know? it's it's rhythm you yeah. know there's a rhythm to life mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good point. You're, what you're describing in turn in terms of my interpretation uh, is a form of creativity where things that not everyone would connect get connected mm -hmm. through interest I, I, I don't know but there there is a uh, it is definitely a, a form of creativity and mm -hmm. it, it's something that uh, uh, I, I don't want to be immodest it's something that I feel comes out in my writing as well oh mm -hmm. for sure yeah Lisa and I play this game and we haven't done it for a while because of um, being quarantined and COVID but we'll go to public places and um Las Vegas is really good. And you sit across from people and, and you just make up stories about who they are, what they're actually really doing. There's a lot of affairs. It's, oh, there's a lot of and stuff drug going deals. on. <laughs> now, we, now as we travel, we sit in rest areas and look at people getting in and out of their cars. And yeah, and you say, what they're oh, doing. you know what? There's really a person. There's a person. lot of drug deals. <laughs> there's a body in the trunk of that car over there. There is. That's why <laughs> the guy keeps walking around and looking down to see. Yeah, why? Yeah, yeah. what's up with that? You know, somebody slashed so, his tires. That's right. <laughs> so well, that's good. <laughs> interesting that you say that because well, when I was in high school, uh, I, I lived an entirely different life. In fact, I showed up on Facebook one day and someone in my class uh, at high school got through to me and said, we thought definitely you'd be dead by the time you were 18. Wow. Said, we are shocked. So wow. I, I, what I'm leading to is I never read much in high school, but when I was a senior, I was called upon to give a book report and I got up in front of the class and made up the story for the book cool and at the end of it, the teacher 
doctor said, I want to read that. <laughs> so, so maybe that was a big impetus <laughs> down the road to try to write. Oh, something. wow. That is cool. awesome. That, so did yeah. you make it up while you were standing there? Yes, absolutely. And, and oh, my gosh. It goes back awesome. to connecting these bits that, that uh, is kind of crazy. That's awesome. That's I funny. love this. That was yeah. come full circle. It has yeah. been such a pleasure chatting with you, mm -hmm. Ashby. Uh, yeah. Very, very That's wonderful. Fun. You know, I don't even, I don't know if that's uh, grammatically correct to say very wonderful, but it's been wonderful. <laughs> You're very kind to have me and I thank you very much. Thank you for oh, joining us, fun. everyone, again. Uh, the book is book. The Crossing, and it's by Ashby Jones. Mm -hmm. And go get it on Amazon. I, I am hoping you're on bookshop.org, too. We like them because they help independent bookstores. Go get it from your favorite book outlet. And, um, of course, keep up with us at bigblendradio.com. And uh, every second Wednesday, know that we're interviewing authors. I connected with Books Forward. They're an amazing company that uh, really supports authors and, and, and good ones. Mm -hmm. You know, we've... We've been interviewing authors uh, that they tell us about for over 15 years now. So it's been so much fun. And yeah. Uh, so yeah, check them out, booksforward.com. But bigblendradio.com, every second Wednesday, we have author time and uh, keep up with us uh, for our magazines as well. So thank you so much, Ashby. You take care. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.